the minute I cross a lobby in a building to see a client, my phone goes off and into my bag. For some of you, that's like, oh my God, it's just like telling a drug addict to go cold turkey. And if you can't switch your phone off, put it into flight mode. And if you can't put it into flight mode, put it into silent mode. And if you can't do any of those things, switch all the red dots notifications off on your phone. And in that scale of things to do, you'll eventually progress to getting the phone off. So I'm in the lobby, switch the phone off, put it in my bag, step into the lift, three deep breaths. And I'm deliberate in taking breathing through my nose, down through my throat, all the way to my lungs, right to the bottom of my lungs and out through my mouth. And while I'm doing that, I'm simply asking myself the question, how can I serve who I'm meeting with the best? So I just do that. And I'm not doing it like a yoga teacher and I'm not (laughs) in the lift. It's not like somebody thinks I've just gone out for a run or I'm trying to escape the police. The three deep breaths are really unnoticeable. Nobody would notice I was doing it. And then when I get to reception, I'm normally asked what I like tea, coffee, some kind of refreshment. I always ask for a glass of water. And depending on how many people I'm meeting, I'm asking for water for them. So if all you did was switch off your distractions, drink water and breathe deeply before you start the process of listening, you'd be ahead of 86% of people and you create a different listening experience for everybody. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Hey, it's Srini. So I just want to tell you how much I appreciate the fact that you're listening to the show. And if you found the podcast fascinating, instructive, inspiring, or maybe even heartwarming, If there's one person you could think of who'd appreciate our show, a friend or a family member, take a moment and share the show with them because good ideas are meant to be shared. Oscar, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. G'day, Srini. I'm really looking forward to listening to your questions, but more importantly, how was the surf today? Well, the surf was actually quite good. Uh, you know, it, granted, I got you know caught in a bad current, but <laughs> that's a whole other story that I don't think people really care that much about. Uh, you, you realize we're, 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 we're villains to each other. I'm an ocean swimmer and you're an ocean surfer. You know, oh, so yeah, when we we're going definitely. out, we're trying to figure out how to get the heck out of your way. And when you're on a wave, you're relatively unpredictable. <laughs> and I'm trying to basically think to myself, why the hell are you in the water? Go swim somewhere else on the beach. <laughs> uh, well, so uh, I, I think given the nature of your work, uh, you know, this is a question that I like to start with on occasion. Uh, but, you know, I found it about you through your publicist and I was immediately intrigued given the fact that your work was all about listening. And I thought, okay, this is really a question that really makes some of the sense. What social group were you a part of uh, when you were in high school? And what impact did those people end up having on your life and the choices that you've made throughout your career? Yeah, my social group had a profound impact on me. I went to a school with 23 nationalities. The part of Sydney, Australia, where I'm from is right next to the immigration centre. So when you come to Australia, you're more than likely to go to Sydney, the largest city by population. And at the time I was at school, there was wars in Vietnam. There were wars in South America. There were people fleeing Eastern Europe and the Soviet bloc at that time. So that meant we had fantastic lunches, a swap with each other. We could learn phrases and how to swear in all kinds of nationalities. But the one thing that (laughs) unified Ashrini was an Italian card game called Briscola. And Briscola was not too dissimilar to most uh, kind of cards. They have suits in them and all of that. But it's a game played in pairs. So you would play me and somebody else versus somebody else and somebody else. So two teams, two people on each team, and you sit diagonally opposite each other for this card game. Now, one of the things you don't know about me, Srini, is I have this thing called dyscalculus, which means I have a poor relationship with numbers. I transpose numbers, which means if you said to me 91732, I would probably think in my head 97312 or something like that, which means I'm appalling at counting cards. But what I learned 
well after the fact. Oh, it became great at reading body language. And despite the fact we were playing against the team who were speaking Chinese against each other and I was on a team with a guy from Yugoslavia or a guy from Uruguay or a guy from Poland and we'd have to speak English and they could understand what they were, we were saying, I was reading their face every single time. And because they were speaking in their home language, they were really arrogant and not paying attention to their body language. (laughs) So I got taught at a really early age the currency of listening when you're not listening to the words and trying to understand the meaning well beyond the words. Now, it took three decades for me to catch up with that learning, but my social group had a profound impact on the rest of my life because I look back then and I go, wow, if only I would have started three decades sooner in my quest to create 100 million deep listeners in the world, I would have got there much sooner. But it's ironic that uh, I'm a son of two first-generation migrants from Italy. can't speak a word of Italian because my parents Mm. are kind of modern Romeo and Juliet story where they got kind of kicked out of their families for getting married and uh, I didn't get to learn Italian and yet I was playing an Italian card game against the guys from Vietnam, Poland and uh, Uruguay. Wow. Okay. There's so many more questions that come from that. Uh, so, you know, based on, on the, sort of the, the historical context, so I'm guessing this was like early to late seventies when you're in high school. Okay. The reason that I brought that up is, is I, you may not know this about me, but uh, I actually spent four years living in Australia. My dad did his PhD in Adelaide. So we were in Australia from 1978 to 1982. Okay. And one of the reasons I was curious about this is because, you know, you mentioned that you had this incredibly ethnically diverse group. And one of the things I remember my dad telling me as I was growing up was that, you know, at that time, he said, you'd be surprised that there was a lot of racism. Um, he had landlords who would actually say, hey, you know, he he would bring, you know, a a black person from Africa, like a grad student to rent the place and the person wouldn't rent it to the point where my dad actually had to call around and say, hey, listen, I have another grad student who's looking for a place. He's black. And by the way, if you're not going to rent to him, I would really like you to know so we don't waste our gas money driving over there. Uh, Hmm. I wonder, you know, one, particularly given the world that we're in today, I mean, you are in Australia, but we're in America. Uh, what were race relations like at that time? And, you know, why do you think that you had the experience you did and then somebody like my dad had that experience? Australia is a story of two distinct stories. For millennia, many, many tribes, nearly 200 Aboriginal tribes, lived in complete harmony across the continent with no problems whatsoever. And the Australian Aborigines have a a lot to teach us in this story about why is Australia racist and whether it's Australia being racist to Chinese, whether it's Australia being racist to people from Africa. And when my parents came here, they were called the wogs of the, and it was a disparaging term, And um, people from Northern Europe probably didn't get this as much as people from Southern Europe, particularly the Greeks, uh, the Italians, the Spaniards, who had darker skin um, because they were more Southern Europe. So Australia from day one has been founded on its modern Australia day one, the English version of the Australian story is founded on racism immediately. The um, British troops effectively came here and exterminated a great number of the Aboriginal tribes because they didn't understand them. And, and that continues through to modern day. But when there was a gold rush in Australia in the 1860s, there was um, political parties founded on blocking Chinese from coming to Australia. And that that's con- continued on. It was only uh, 1969 when Aboriginals were actually counted in the census. Up until then, they were considered fauna and flora, even though they were uh, fighting in wars for Australians. And uh, Australia has a very complicated relationship with new migrants and migrants coming from the Middle East right now are experiencing exactly the same thing that my parents experienced, the Chinese experienced. 
But I have this very firm belief that multiculturalism is and has been great for Australia. I, I, mm. I've had personal experience of that, and it takes the next generation to go through a schooling system together for that to get washed out of yeah. the thinking. But there are people who hold on desperately to when we were great in the past and in the past maybe we weren't so great, just the memories we hold about the past might be great as well. So, yes, Australia is a racist country and was founded on racist principles and Australia had an immigration policy up until the late 1950s called the White Australia Policy. That, that, they, that you couldn't migrate to Australia unless your ethnic race was something that resembled uh, a Caucasian European. Wow. Which is funny because, you know, I think by the time my parents uh, migrated to Australia, like they said part of why they went to Australia first is because it was one of the easiest places for immigrants to go to. Uh, it, it's funny you mentioned, you know, kids of, of different um, cultures going through school together. And I think it's such a relevant uh, topic given we're talking about listening, mm. because in, in my mind, I think that, you know, basically eliminating this from culture really requires listening to each other. And it's funny because I think in 25 years of living in the United States, like we came maybe longer, you know, I'm terrible at math, much like you are with numbers. <laughs> uh, I have an Indian person who sucks at math, contrary to popular belief, we're not all good at math. But, uh, you know, I think one of the things that has always been interesting to me is I grew up in Texas and I witnessed, you know, outright racism, not towards me. And in all this time, my parents had never once brought up the issue of racism with me. And then, you know, 2017, I was about to get on a flight. I would just gotten out of the water and saying, I was surfing. My dad calls me and he says, hey, are you traveling anywhere this week? And I said, yeah, why? Uh, he said, well, if anybody says anything to you on a plane, don't say anything. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, wait a minute, we lived in Texas and you've never once brought up anything like this. What the hell? Which is, is really kind of a, a disturbing, it's disturbing to think that we may have progressed back, regressed in terms of race relations, you know, with all the progress we've made. I'm curious what prompted him to say that. Well, I, I think that it was, you know, it was right after the election in 2016. And so it, I think part of it was just what, what, but he was also, it was also a lot of what he was watching on the news. Mm. And I, that's why. Uh, but it was just a strange comment because I never, it, it, like I said, even living in Texas for seven years, where you would think that would mm. be where we would have this conversation, it never happened. Yeah. The, the, um, the role of fear to create conflict and separate rather than unify us is, kind of the opposite of listening in modern technologies and modern broadcast methods. We have more technology than ever before to broadcast a message. We've amplified every message possible and yet we haven't spent the same time and thinking around how to unify people through listening. And you, maybe you went to more enlightened schools in Australia. We didn't have listening mm. teachers when we grew up. We had teachers for math and we had teachers for language and geography and history, but we never had teachers for listening, despite the fact we spend more than half our day actually listening. But most of us don't know what um, add, subtract, divide, and multiply means when it comes to listening. I mean, we have a language to describe wines as fruity and bold and red and white but we don't have that language when it comes to listening and we don't you know we can talk about cheese and all kinds of different abstract topics but we all struggle to know what good listening sounds like because uh three fascinating stats for me Shrini are 86 percent of us think we're above average iq 84% of us think we're above average car drivers and 83% of us think we're above average listeners. Yeah. Now, all those are statistically <laughs> impossible, but <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to the problem of listening. You know, we don't know what good listening is most of the time because we, we don't know. The only time we ever heard anything about listening is maybe when our parents squawked at us and said, I don't understand why you don't listen. <laughs> yeah. 
so I think it's interesting and, that you brought up broadcast of, of all things, because I, I wonder from a perspective of media, right? Like, what is the job then of an Anderson Cooper or somebody who is a news broadcaster whose job it is to speak to us mm-hmm. in the context of listening? What is the job that they have to do? And, and what is the role do you think that media plays? What is the responsibility of media when it comes to this? I think I think media sometimes fo- focus and fixate on separation and division because that creates conflict and in conflict we create tension and in tension we create engagement and in engagement we can sell advertising. You know, let's not be naive to think that media outlets are anything other than thinking about how to produce profits. Mm-hmm. They, very few media outlets are existing out there for the purpose of education. Maybe an NPR. Yeah. Maybe. Um, and you would kind of contrast the Cooper Anderson with uh, a Terry Gross and they listen very differently mm-hmm. as an example. Willingness, uh, listening is the willingness to have your mind changed. And I don't think most journalists go into a conversation with a willingness to have their mind changed. They are there to ask questions, to trap the person they're interviewing them and getting a really sensational five to 15 second soundbite that will be replayed on all the other networks. That's not listening. I've interviewed a number of journalists about how they listen, how they prepare for interviews. And yeah, for a lot of them, what they learn, if they listen really well, it's listening to the pauses. It's being with the silence. It's noticing when the body language changes. It's got nothing to do with how they listen to the words that are coming across. So I think there's there's a great responsibility on broadcasters to go in with an agenda to have their mind changed. But most broadcasters have a fixed position on an issue, on a set of audience members that they believe they're talking to, and they will adopt a strategy and approach that serves them. Very few media outlets, unless they're national broadcasters, CBC, BBC, those those kind of outlets that are publicly funded that are trying to both educate. Two years ago, I spent a lot of time listening to podcasts, to radio stations and to TV shows that I violently disagreed with because I thought, if I really want to believe and act on the stuff I'm doing, I need to really start to spend time and listen to the people I disagree with. Because if I'm willing to believe that listening is about having your mind changed, then why don't I spend time with these people? And it was fascinating for me to go in with an empty mind and no agenda to listen to these kinds of um, broadcasters, uh, even to bloggers that, that I disagree with to go, um, am I disagreeing with them or am I disagreeing with what they say? That was the first thing I needed to explore. And the second thing I asked myself is what assumptions am I holding on to too tightly that might be false in the way I'm interacting with this idea that they're trying to produce? So I think listening is a mindset. It's not just uh, something you do with your ears and your eyes. And ultimately, listening's the difference between hearing and listening and are you willing to have your mind change? For a lot of us, we're actually not. We we hold on tightly to ideas or experiences of the past and we're not open to exploring what's possible there. Is there any specific issue that you have had your mind changed about by going and, and you know, consuming content uh, you know, by people that you vehemently disagree with? Yeah, um, a lot actually. And I play with this tension all the time. You know, I'm on, a, I'm on this quest to create 100 million deep listeners in the world and yet every piece of evidence in front of me says speaking is the way to change the world, Oscar, not listening. <laughs> and Srini, my superhero power was my cloak of invisibility. As the listening guy, my job is to make other people great listeners. and. As I went on this journey, I went, you're hiding behind podcasts and writing is serving no one. You need to get out and speak. 
And my opening line when I stand on stage is always, the irony is not lost on you that I'm speaking to you about listening. (laughs) So the biggest change for me was I felt in the past before I intersected with people whose ideas I vehemently disagreed with, I felt in the past that if I if I create meaningful content, if I create it in a compelling way, if I create it in a skillful, artful, and subtle way, that, that will be enough. And the reality that I learned is that's true, just not true all the time. So for me, the big change for me is, Oscar, get over yourself and get out there and speak on the topic of listening. You know, this year alone, I've probably done 60 podcast interviews exactly like this. I've probably done a handful of uh, radio interviews and a TV interview. And ironically, in the TV interview, the microphone didn't work. Uh, so that was fun watching them all work behind the scenes to change the microphone out while the, uh, while the interviewer padded out. Apparently, that's the term they use when they have to talk a little bit longer. So that's the big change for me. And it sounds simple, doesn't it? But Do you know how hard I fought? For how long I fought? I fought for six months against that concept. No, Oscar, if you're a great listener, you can change the world through listening. Well, that's partly true, Oscar, said the other half of my brain. But you need to get out there and you need to be visible and you need to put your idea out there and you need to be challenged. And that was scary for me. And a lot of people have been sending me messages saying it's great to hear you speaking because not many people are speaking on this topic i wish there were more people speaking on this topic and surprisingly for me not surprisingly probably for anybody else the idea spreads faster if i speak about it more so Mm. Srini, that's a really big learning for me (laughs) well okay so i i want to come back to this because i think it'll actually make a perfect segue into your work but i want to go back to something you said earlier um, which was about your parents and the fact that they were both effectively excommunicated from their families. Yeah. Uh, this Romeo and Juliet story. Yeah. One, I wonder, you know, what impact that had on you in terms of human dynamics and relationships and were they ever welcomed back at any point? Honestly, while I was growing up, I didn't know any different. So no, yeah. it didn't have any impact on me at all. Maybe down the track, if I want to unpick my mental spaghetti, I might have made up a whole bunch of stories about that. But in that moment, it accelerated my integration into Australian society rather than going to Saturday school. So in in our area, there's a very big Saturday school dynamic where Saturday school is your home language school. So there were Greek schools, Italian schools, there were Vietnamese schools, there were Spanish schools, there were Polish schools, and typically they're associated with the church groups or the religions that sit around them as well. And you would learn your home language, you would learn about your home culture, you would learn about your home foods, you would learn about your home language, you would learn about your home folklore. I learned about cricket, I learned about tennis, I learned about playing soccer, I learned about barbecues, I learned about these fascinating things called Devon sandwiches. Oh my goodness. I think about the worst parts of any bit of meat that you could get and they're all kind of pasted together. They're the leftover meat off the production line and uh, that was a big deal in our part of the world. If you could have a Devon sandwich with some um, ketchup or some tomato sauces, we would call it in Australia. That was the height of decadence. If you could have a Devon sandwich, it was like, wow. And it wasn't until I went to this school that I was mentioning earlier on in high school, it was like, wow, there's this whole world out there of amazing food that doesn't come between two pieces of white bread with some sauce on it. So in that moment, No, didn't make a difference to me at all. And yet now, the thing I yearn for, the thing I love, the thing I have passion for is Andrea Botticelli. I have um, amazing yearning to learn more about the Italian language, about Italian history, about Italian music, about the art of Italy, about so many things about Italy. Now, the good news for my parents' family and my mum's family, my dad's family, eventually, I think partly because of this, 
the strain of having to operate independently in Australia, they, they ended up divorcing. So what ended up happening is I got reconnected to those families in my teenage years, but I didn't have any backstory, any common experiences with them. They all spoke Italian to each other. I couldn't, I didn't understand what they were saying. Eventually I could make up a few words in what they were saying, but mostly no, I didn't. So in, in looking back, yeah, I missed out on stuff. But in the moment as a kid, that was awesome. I learned how to play cricket and we played tennis on the on the road <laughs> with our neighbours and things like that. Whereas if if I wasn't, I'd be going to Italian school on a Saturday and having a completely different experience. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. So how in the world did you turn this into a career that eventually led you to Microsoft? <laughs> Well, I mentioned earlier on, I have this thing called dyscalculus. So my dad always said to me, Oscar, you know, work hard at school, study hard. No, no, no different to what your dad would have taught you through the Indian traditions. And any migrants are taught that education is, is the way to social progress and, and economic success. So my dad worked really hard. He was self-taught. He didn't own a pair of shoes till he was 14 years of age. And he, he worked when he, was back in his hometown in in Italy. They herded goats, and you know they had a very small farm. They had no no need for shoes where they came from. So he was all self taught, and he had to reteach him self English as well. So he's an amazing guy, and he had a very strong work ethic. And he said, "You can't always be the smartest in the room, Oscar. But you can always be the hardest working." And he said to me, "Oscar, you can get a job as an accountant because accountants will never." Be out of work. How ironic that is now when we look at what technology can do and how even the accounting profession is being challenged with the kind of work they do. Any kind of repetitive rules based work may be under threat from computer technology. So I did what my dad told me to do. I studied hard. I, I went to, to university. I enrolled in an accounting course and I did a cadetship with an accounting firm. And six weeks in, my manager, Robert, took me aside so in the days we were doing spreadsheets they were a3 sheets of paper they were literally sheets they weren't on a computer and uh, we i worked in pencil and robert my manager he was a bit uh, more experienced than me he got to work in pen um, because he was uh, much more accurate than me but what happened was i would always bring the spreadsheet to robert and go this is, uh, this, this isn't adding up this column should equal that column and that column is not equal to that column. Anyway, Robert said to me, hey, at the lunch break, we're going to do a quick little quiz. And I went, oh, yeah, okay. So we, we were at a Jaguar dealer uh, in the eastern part of Sydney and I was literally counting spark plugs. That, that's what, what I had to do as part of the audit stock take work. Anyway, we came back and we had lunch and we'd progressed beyond the Devon sandwiches that I mentioned earlier on. We're probably having something else altogether. And Robert sat me down and read out 20 phone numbers and he asked me to write them down. Now, the good news is I got 16 right. The bad news is I got four wrong when I wrote them down. And the four that I wrote down, I'd transpose the numbers consistently. That meant I'd had exactly the right numbers in exactly the wrong order. And a bit of maths trivia, if you can divide the two numbers by the difference between the two numbers 
by nine, you've transposed the number. So Robert did that exercise and straight away of the four, I'd got all four right. I just got them in the wrong order. And he said, Houston, we have a problem. And he turned to me and he said, we're going to have to find another career for you. And I just melted. I was holding it together and and I went to the toilet and cried. I probably cried for about 20 minutes because I got this cadetship, which meant they would pay for my university books. And my dad had built up all this thing about accounting and it was over. And for three weeks, we continued working and Robert had spoken to his manager and his manager, Bill, came to me and him over lunch and said, well, Oscar, we've got a big problem here. How are we going to fix it? And I wasn't sure if that was a rhetorical question or he was actually asking me for the answer. And he he said something that would change the rest of my life. He says, what do you know about computers? I said, Bill, I know absolutely nothing about computers. And he says, that's brilliant, Oscar. We're never going to lie to each other from now on, are we? And I said, I didn't think I had. He said, no, no, it's like, it's good that you're telling the truth. He says, you're a fast learner, I'm sure. Why don't you install these things called computers into our accounting firm and move us from paper to electronic? And that started a journey that ended up in last working career, 11 years as a a marketing director of Microsoft, Srini, and uh, there are many steps in between there, but uh, getting into Microsoft was kind of relatively eye-opening and career-changing for me because it was in that moment at Microsoft that a couple of experiences taught me again the power of listening. And I was doing this video conference with the Vice President of Australia, with the regional directors from Singapore and Seattle from head office. And it was this budget kind of negotiation meeting, and it was quite tense. Now, the dynamic is really simple. How much money can Australia produce is what head office wants. Australia goes, what's realistic that we can produce and not create demotivation for the local sales teams because they think it's unachievable. And Singapore, the regional head office, has to play a role like Switzerland, Geneva, kind of the peacemaker role between the two of them. So it's a really tense meeting. It happens every year, happens in a relatively similar format. And it was about the fourth year I'd been part of these meetings. And 20 minutes into this meeting where there's all this shouting and arguing about formulas and market growth and all this stuff that doesn't really matter. Apparently, I said something that changed the meeting. And what happened at the end of the meeting, my vice president, Tracy, asked me to stay behind. And the way she said it is, Oscar, could you stay behind, please? And in that moment, (laughs) the only thing that went through my head, Trini, was how much money have I got in my bank account? Because I'm sure I'm going to get fired. And (laughs) I don't know how many months I've got left. And I've got a mortgage to pay. So Tracy sat me down at the end of the meeting and she asked me a question that became another link in the chain of this story about 100 million deep listeners. And she said, thank you, Oscar. The way you listen changed the meeting. And I'm not sure you realize it. And I said, Tracy, honestly, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm so grateful because I thought you were going to fire me. And she just laughed. She goes, of course you'd think that, Oscar. You're always looking on the wrong side of it. You're always glass half empty rather than half full. And I said, well, what happened? She said, at the 20-minute mark, you did that thing. And I said, that thing? She said, that question you asked. She said, you realize you changed the whole tone of the meeting. You changed the way everybody listened to each other and themselves. And we've got a really productive outcome. And I think it was mostly because of what you did. She said, if you could teach the world how to do that, you could change the world. But you could do it faster if you coded it. And I said, do you mean code or do you mean code code? And because we're at Microsoft, when you say code something, it means put it into computer software. And she said, no, I mean code code. 
<laughs> and at that point, she blew my mind and I just went, "How? I don't even know what I said at the 20-minute mark. I don't know how to code it. How can I get the heck out of here because I've got a whole bunch of stuff I've got to put into systems to start to get these budgets out to the fear-based organisation? And she said, you do know what you said at the 20-minute mark. And I said, nah, nah, nah. Uh, what did I say? <laughs> she said, you ask the room, what assumptions are we all holding on to that could be false? And in that moment, you created a circuit breaker for the room that asked them really skillfully, can we all admit we're wrong? Can we all admit we don't know everything? But you did it in such a simple way. I said, but that question was for me, Tracy. I was trying to figure out what I was holding on to too tightly that could be wrong because I was arguing a position as well. She said, yes, but you actually asked the question and everybody else didn't. And from that point on, everybody started talking about the assumption rather than the assertion. And I went, okay. <laughs> and Srini, I just walked out of the meeting and I didn't think anything of it, except eight weeks later, we had to do the reverse. We were head office and we had to talk to our state-based sellers to get them to accept the money that we'd taken from our head office into their quotas, their budgets, their, their what would affect their commissions, their mortgages, their everything that happened with their families. And the same thing happens, of course. Head office thinks they're right. The field thinks the head office has got no idea. And roughly about halfway through the meeting, I asked that question again. And the same thing happened. But the host of the meeting was our CFO, Chief Operating Officer at the time, Brian. And at the end of the meeting, he said to me, Oscar, can you stay behind? So I knew it wasn't I wasn't going to get sacked. At least I hope I wasn't going to get sacked. And Brian said to me at the end of the meeting, he says, can you teach me how to do that thing that you do? And I said, Brian, is it the uh, question thing that I do? He goes, yeah, you, you changed the room. You changed me. You changed the way I thought about this when you asked that question. He said, can you sit in a couple of my meetings with my team and then tell me how to improve my listening after the meeting. And I thought, that's nuts. What? I'm, I'm just a marketing director. What, what do I know? And, uh, and, and I did. And he, he said the same thing to me. He said, you know, if you could teach others how to do this, you could change the world. And I, again, I walked out of that room. I never thought anything about it at all. And then uh, Tracy spoke to me about three months later and she says, Oscar, there's this whole profession that you should know about and uh, you should go and research it and you should go and study it while you're at Microsoft. And, and they're a great employer. They were happy to kind of make some kind of financial contribution to my, to my learning. And that started the journey to exploring listening of all things. Wow. Okay. I love this because I think it's such a perfect setup to get into the framework. And I think particularly, you know, you brought up uh, what assumptions are we making that are false? And I want to start with listening to yourself. Because when I listen to you say this, and I, I hear you, you talk about this, I, I start to think to myself, I'm like, you know, I wonder what assumptions am I making in my own story, in my own head that could be false? that are limiting my life, making me unhappy. And I'm guessing a lot of people are doing the same thing. So let, let's do a deeper dive into this idea of listening to yourself, like dissect that for me. And how might we let go of the assumptions that we're making that are not empowering to us? This happened about six months ago where I was, I was working with a client who wasn't actually a client. So the situation was... Zoe was working with another organization that she was quite frustrated with in terms of uh, helping her to become a better leader. And she works inside a really big technology company and she just got a brand new job there. And she'd been working with this consulting organization and she was really frustrated with them. And 
she was referred to me and she says, I want to change organisations. And whenever anybody says that to me, I, I think that's an unresolved story in them listening to themselves. And I said, oh, Zoe, what, what's this all about? You know, oh, they're not getting the most out of me. They're not pushing me hard enough. They're not good at whatever they're doing. Their framework is not right. It's not accelerating. I'm not getting the results I need. And it, was, it felt like they were poking a finger at somebody else. So I said to Zoe, I said, are you okay if I ask you a few questions? And she said, yeah, sure. And I said, Zoe, in that moment where you're talking about what they're not doing right and all of that, how are you turning up? If you were to describe how you were turning up in those meetings, how would you describe it? And the reason I love this story so much, I was at a public event only a couple of weeks ago where Zoe actually told this story from stage, which I thought was very brave of her, but equally very powerful in a story. And she said, well, Oscar, I'm showing up as, and she, and it was this really long pause, Trini, and I'm okay with a silence. I think the West is not comfortable with silence. We call it the awkward silence. We call it the pregnant pause. And the East is much better with silence than the West. That's something we can learn. And something we can learn from our Indigenous communities, whether that's Inuits or South American tribes in the Amazon or Aboriginal communities or Maoris, get comfortable with silence. So I just let the silence do the heavy lifting in this conversation. It probably took Zoe 45 seconds. And what I know, because she's, she said this at a speech recently, what was going through her head was, what's the most innocuous animal I can say so it gives no surface area for this guy to come back at me because I know he's doing these Yoda mind tricks with me whatever animal I say he's going to use against me and she said me cat she said me a cat was the most innocuous animal that came to mind they're cute they're furry they're cuddly they work together really really well um they help each other out and sometimes they fearsome and take on bigger adversaries like like snakes, for example. And so Zoe said to me, well, I'm showing up as a meerkat, Oscar. I said, great. And which animal should you be showing up as? And again, she went, mm, and there was this really long pause. And she came back and she said, actually, I should be turning up like a lion. And I went, Okay. I said, so what responsibility are you taking for the fact you're showing up with a mask on? And you could feel this shift in her whole body energy. She was, she was in Singapore while this conversation was going on. I was in Sydney. It was all over the telephone. And I asked her, I could feel a change for her. It's kind of listening beyond the words. And I said, so if something's happening for you, talk me through what's going on. She goes, shit, this is about me, isn't it? It's not about them. I said, well, is it? She goes, I'm putting this mask on. And, and I said, okay. So there's this saying, Zoe, that says, how we do one thing is how we do everything. Where else is this showing up? And again, you could hear the vibration change in her vocal cords and the way she was talking kind of went a bit further down here and you could tell it was getting a bit more emotional for her. And she said, oh, this is showing up everywhere, Oscar. I'm wearing masks everywhere. And I said, and what's the cost of that? And she goes, oh, it's so draining. And, and we went through this whole conversation. And eventually she said, the problem's not the consultant, is it? I said, I don't know. She says, the problem's me. And I said, okay, so what are you going to do with it? She goes, I have to go back to the consultant and have this conversation, don't I? I said, well, if that's what you feel you need to do, then go do that. And she did. And they decided to separate and not work together, and she decided to come and work for me because she said three questions got her faster to listening to herself than working with the other consultant for six months. Now, that's not because I'm brilliant. It's just because Zoe had the courage to go and listen to herself and listen to herself deeply. 
because most of us think being fixated, obsessed and focused on the speaker is the starting point of good listening. The starting point of good listening is listening to yourself. You need to be available to the other person. And if you've got a radio station playing a frequency about a song, there might be a country and western song about ba-ding, 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 and it's a repetitive song about some drama in your life that you're dragging along with you. That's not a productive way to start listening. Most of us are distracted before we even turn up how to listen. Before we even get into the conversation, we're thinking about the last thing in our life or the next thing in our life or a big conflict in our life or a big drama in our life or what we've got to do in the evening or what we've got to do on the weekend. It's happening to you right now listening to this podcast. Whether you're running, whether you're commuting, whether you're cooking, you're being completely distracted right now. Because for most of us, we don't know that although Oscar speaks at 125 words a minute, you can listen at 400 words a minute. So I need to speak three times faster for your brain to go, hurry up, because I'm speaking too slow for you. Now, racehorse callers and um, cattle auctioneers speak at about 200 words a minute. But for most of us, we're filling in the gaps and we're zoning out and we're thinking about other things rather than being completely present. And the reason we are is because we don't prepare ourselves to listen. Whenever you go to a concert, whether that's a rock concert or a classic music concert, you go through a ritual to get there. You go through a ritual as you go to sit in your seat or find the area you're going to stand at a, at a concert. But for most of us, we don't even think about that preparation before we get into the conversation, Trini. So for all of us, that's one of the most important things is our internal distractions. But the other thing that amplifies this are the external distractions. And for most of us, it's our cell phone, it's our laptop, it's our iPad. These external distractions that we think are really important aren't. 86% of people in our research database struggle with external distractions. And of the 86%, two-thirds struggle with their cell phone. So if I give you one tip for listening to yourself, if you want to make a big difference there, switch your cell phone into flight mode, switch your laptop into flight mode, switch your iPad into flight mode so those buzzes and bings and screen notifications go off and it will completely transform your ability to be ready to listen. So we haven't got to the listening bit yet, but just getting yourself ready to listen, Trini. Well, it's funny that you say that because I noticed this. I, I made a point at you know uh, some point last year when I would go on a date with somebody, I would turn off the phone once I arrived at wherever it is that I was meeting them. And it made a huge difference in the entire interaction. I, I was hosting a Microsoft vice president from Seattle in 2007. Peter ran a big organization. He looked after about 30,000 people, it represented about, I don't know, $500 million in revenue. And he was hosting 20 CEOs in Australia in a hotel room. He'd flown directly in from Seattle that morning. I was the first meeting, nine o'clock. Peter sat down at the head of the table. I was just about to introduce Peter. And Peter did something amazing that I'll remember for the rest of my life. He stood up switched his cell phone off, walked to the corner, put it in his bag and sat back down. He apologized to everybody in the room and he says, the most important thing I can do for the next hour is pay complete attention to everybody in this room. I'm really sorry. Now, what do you think happened next? Everybody followed suit. So 17 of the 20 followed suit, meaning they either switched it into flight mode or put it in their bag. And after 45 minutes, Peter left that room and went to another meeting with another group of CEOs being hosted by another person like me and Microsoft. And I had a half an hour debrief with that group. And that group still meets today, ironically, but they've all left the companies they were at. They may or may not work in technologies now. And all of them said, it was great to listen to other opinions in this room. And it's all because we switched off our cell phones. So the most important thing every single one of us can do is pay attention to the other person. It's an amazing currency. I was working with 
Mick, a tech leader, two and a half years ago. He rang me up on a Monday morning about quarter quarter past eight, and he was in his car, and I was in my car, and we were we were chatting, and he kind of just blurted out, "Hey, Oscar, you nearly cost me my marriage last Friday," and I went, "Okay, tell me more, Mick." <laughs> he says. It was about 7.30 on a Friday night. We'd put the kids to bed. My wife had cleared the table, and then she said those words we all dread. I said, what words are those? He says, his wife said to him, we need to talk. We need to talk at the dinner table. So he went, he sat down, he faced his wife, and they had a chat. And she said to him, Mick, just be honest with me. I know you're having an affair. Just tell me who it is, because in the last three months, you've never paid me so much attention as you have in the last three months, and I know you're trying to distract me with all this attention. And he looked at her and he said, it's not what you think it is. And she goes, don't lie to me, just tell me honestly who it is. And he goes, okay, it's not what you think it is, it's not a her, it's a him. (laughs) <laughs> she burst out crying because she jumped to the assumption you might have just jumped to. And he yeah. grabbed her hand and he said, no, no, it's not what you think it is. The last three months I've been working with someone who's teaching me how to listen. And with that, she sighed and relaxed apparently. And he gave her a big hug and she just said to him, I've never felt so sexy as I have in the last three months with all the attention you've paid me. And he said, Oscar, although you nearly cost me my marriage, it was a great Friday night and I'll leave the rest to everyone's imagination. (laughs) You know, I love that you brought up attention as a currency. And it's funny because I gave a talk recently where, you know, it was about building a more attentive workforce. For some reason, that seems to be the subject that I get invited to talk a lot about lately, which is ironic because for me, that's something I've struggled with my whole life. But I I told a story about how my brother uh, in law and my sister met. And this actually made it into the wedding speech because I'm the one who had to write the wedding speech because I'm a public speaker. So you get recruited to do those things when there's a wedding. Uh, But I asked my dad, uh, you know, what is it that makes this guy perfect for my sister? And this is, has stayed with me for a really long time, and I've echoed this story multiple times. Uh, you know, when they had their first date, he, my sister casually dropped the fact that she played the cello, and I always thought I'd, I'd barely remember her playing the cello because I was an all-state band, and that was really good. And I was like, yeah, she wasn't at that. <laughs> I was like, that's overstating her, her abilities. But on their fifth date, he called her, and he said, hey, Yo-Yo Ma is coming to the Hollywood Bowl. Do you want to go? And when I asked my dad, I said, what is it? that makes him perfect because that was how I wanted to have him start the speech. And he said he pays attention to her. And Mm. that was the story he told. Powerful. And and the reason it's powerful is it's easy to spot, shine the spotlight on it because it's so rare. And that's something we can all change. We can all spend a bit more time paying attention to ourselves first so we can be available to pay attention to others. And uh, the three tips I'm most commonly asked for, are, you know, when switch off all those distractions. And number two, drink water while you're listening to somebody. A hydrated brain is a listening brain. We kind of go through most of the day in the West dehydrated. And the brain is 5% of the body mass, yet it consumes 26% of the blood sugars. So the best way to get blood sugars to the brain is through hydration. And then tip number three, the deeper you breathe, the deeper you listen, and it's not for you to focus on the other, but it's to prepare your mind with a state and place to be available to listen to the other. Three simple deep breaths will transform your state and bring you into the present to notice what's going on for you now and ideally what's not going on for you now and the way I wrap it up into a ritual for me is the minute I cross a lobby in a building to see a client my phone goes off and into my bag for some of you that's like oh my god it's just like telling a drug addict to go cold turkey 
And if you can't switch your phone off, put it into flight mode. And if you can't put it into flight mode, put it into silent mode. And if you can't do any of those things, switch all the red dots notifications off on your phone. And in that scale of things to do, you'll eventually progress to getting the phone off. So I'm in the lobby, switch the phone off, put it in my bag, step into the lift, three deep breaths. And I'm deliberate in taking breathing through my nose, down through my throat, all the way to my lungs, right to the bottom of my lungs and out through my mouth. And while I'm doing that, I'm simply asking myself the question, how can I serve who I'm meeting with the best? So I just do that. And I'm not doing it like a yoga teacher and I'm not (sighs) in the lift. It's not like somebody thinks I've just gone out for a run or I'm trying to escape the police. The three deep breaths are really unnoticeable. Nobody would notice I was doing it. And then when I get to reception, I'm normally asked what I like tea, coffee, some kind of refreshment. I always ask for a glass of water. And depending on how many people I'm meeting, I'm asking for water for them. So if all you did was switch off your distractions, drink water and breathe deeply before you start the process of listening, you'd be ahead of 86% of people and you create a different listening experience for everybody. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant.